Okay, we're rolling. All right, this is an interview at the New York State Military Museum, Saratoga Springs, New York. It is the 4th of August, 2006, approximately 11.15 a.m. Interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Walter F. Flynn, November 30, 1920. I was born in East Greenwich, New York. Okay. What was your educational background prior to entering service? Well, I had just had a high school education. Okay. Do you remember where you were when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Yes, I was sitting on a couch at my uh, future mother-in-law's house with my girlfriend. You know, it was a Sunday afternoon and we were listening to the news on the radio and that's all it could you could hear on any station was that Pearl Harbor was attacked. Did you know where Pearl Harbor was at the time? Well, someplace in Hawaii. Okay. okay. Yeah, I never heard of it before. Right. What was your reaction when you heard this news? Well, I said, gee, uh, what's going to happen to us? Mm -hmm. I knew, knew we were going to have to uh, either be drafted or enlist. And, Okay. Um, did you enlist or were you drafted? I enlisted because I uh, I didn't want to be a ground pounder. Mm -hmm. And I thought I'd like to fly. Why? Had you ever flown before? Or had it, Just as a passenger. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, when did you enlist? Well, when did I enlist? Uh, the approximate was uh, April of 41. Okay. No, 42 because 42. Uh, yeah, it was December 7th, 41, mm -hmm. so this was okay. April 42. Where did you go for your basic training? I went to Fort Dix, New Jersey. And we had our basic there. And uh, then we went down to Miami Beach, stayed in a hotel and drilled morning, noon, and night. And it was so hot there drilling that we used to pray that it would rain. And from there, uh, I was sent to uh, Tyndall Field, and at, at Tyndall Field was more part of basic training. And uh, <coughs> now, where where was Tyndall Field? Uh, Panama City, Florida. And there, uh, I pulled KP in guard duty. And finally, uh, I was sent to Maxwell Field for classification training to uh, decide whether I was going to go to pilot school, bombardier, or navigator school. And uh, I uh, was selected to go to pilot school, but I was sent home on a 45 day leave until the class started and uh, I think my class started around September so I was probably home during most of the month of August and then in September I reported to the University of Alabama Tuscaloosa and there was a training field there. And that's where I had my primary training. Did you have a ground school first? Well, it was all mixed in. Mm -hmm. You'd fly in the morning, go to ground school in the afternoon, or vice versa. And it was all, all blended in together. What type of aircraft did you fly? Steering. PT-17? PT-17s. That was the biplane and mm -hmm. tail dragger. How did you like the Stearman? I liked it. How long were you there? I would say it was probably uh, two and a half months, maybe ten weeks. And there uh, I saw the, the Stearman and I had eight hours in the stairwell with the instructor and 
I didn't think I was ready for solo, but one day the in instructor <coughs> took us over to uh, another auxiliary field and uh, we landed there and he climbed out and he, I started to climb out and he says, no, you stay here, you're going to fly. Okay. So I flew up. And after uh, primary, we went to Newport, Arkansas for basic, and that was in the BT-13. We used to call that the Volte Vibrator. Why? I don't know. <laughs> And it, it was probably, uh, most of it was with plywood. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were there for 10 weeks and uh, completed some more phases of our training, which more a little more advanced, a little bit of formation flying, uh, cross country and night flying and night navigation. And from there we went to Craig Field, Selma, Alabama where we flew the T-6 and a uh, little more advanced to be at there. There we got gunnery and uh, you know, cross country and night flying and uh, What did you think of the AT-6? Quite a difference between that and the Stearman or the Vault-T. Oh, it was a much better airplane. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was North American. It was a good airplane. But uh, at advanced, we got towards the end of our training there in advanced, we got 10 hours in the P 40. And uh, our, one of our uh, pilots who was a real real gung-ho pilot. He was, you know, first to do everything. He was maxed all the tests and he was the first to fly the P-40 and he was the first to get killed in the P-40. And that happened while we were there at advance, but uh, we uh, finally got through and we graduated and got our commission and got our wings uh, at Craig Field. And uh, after Craig, well, we got our leave to go home, and I went home, and the uh, time I was home, I got married. Mm -hmm. Now, what was this time frame about? What time was that? This is in May of 1943, mm -hmm. when I got married, and I was on leave. And uh, then I reported the... Uh, to uh, Florida for combat training in the P-40, and that was at uh, Pinellas Army Airfield in St. Petersburg, Florida. And there we put in about 60 hours of training, you know, getting us ready for combat, and. Uh, that was probably another six to eight weeks there, and uh, I'm trying to, trying to recollect. Oh, well, we got we, we got our orders to uh, to go to Miami Beach because we were there then on overseas orders. And I had, I had to send my wife home, and uh, we sat around there in Miami Beach wait, just waiting for orders. And, and finally the orders came, and uh, uh, they flew us in a C-47 down to Brazil at Natal. And there we waited for weather and an aircraft, and the aircraft that flew us across the South Atlantic was a B-24. Converted B-24 with bucket seats. And that way we flew across the South Atlantic. And uh, that was uneventful for our flight, but 
one of the flights before us, uh, the B-24, lost one engine, and then it lost another engine, and finally everybody on board had to throw away all their equipment. But they finally made it to Dakar, and uh, from Dakar we flew up the uh, coast of Africa in a C-47, gradually working our way towards Algiers. And uh, there was, uh, I would say, about 30 of us as T-40 pilots. And uh, we were supposed to go to uh, Benghazi, which is in North Africa. And from there we were going to fly P-40s with the 9th Fighter Command. But when we got to Algiers, one of the fellows with us had been a uh, instructor in, in the States in the Southeast Training Command and he ran into a colonel in the latrine. Well, he met him. <laughs> he didn't run into But uh, the colonel recognized Jim and he said, Jim, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm with a group of pilots we're going to the 9th Fighter Command in Benghazi. And he said, oh, I don't think so. And Jim says, why not? And he says, well, they've been, they, they've been deployed back to England. So Jim says, well, yeah, what's going to happen with us? And this colonel said, well, there's three P-38 groups that need pilots. And uh, would you guys like to fly P-38s? And we never had any thoughts we'd get to fly a P-38. Because you know we're trained P-40s, we never had any multi-engine time. But they split us up into three groups, and luckily I wound up with the 27th Squadron of the first fighter group. And now this first fighter group was formed in World War One, 1917, with men like uh, Rickenbacker, who was the 94th at the Ring Squadron, and mm -hmm. Frank Luke, who was 27th Squadron. And uh, the 71st Squadron, which was, it had once been called the 17th, then they changed the 71st. And, and I forget who the uh, big name pilot was that was flying at, or leading the uh, 71st at World War One time, but that's, that's really not important. The important thing was that I wound up in the 27th Squadron of the first fighter group which I think was a good factor in in uh, my surviving the war, being with a unit like that. Why? 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 Well, you got to fly with those people and there was such a camaraderie there and there were days that we couldn't fly because of the weather. We, we would fly locally and you got so that you would fly with any one of them, you know, with either one of them leading. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it was, uh, I don't know, you, you get with a unit and, you know, it's just like a family. And, well, that's the way we felt about each other. So, to get back to uh, my multi-engine time, uh, we had to, you know, read up on the P-38, uh, you know, all the idiosyncrasies about the P-38 and uh, we got our check out by riding in a piggyback. The piggyback is a 38 where they took out the radio mm -hmm. and the armor plate and with a backpack you could sit up there behind a pilot and watch him fly. So I had this flight in the, in the piggyback with the pilot and he climbs out and he says, okay, it's all yours. And here, I, here I was, going to fly a multi-engine airplane and I haven't had any bit of stick time yet, so I flew it. Now, did he sit behind you or were you by yourself? After he climbed out, I was by myself. <laughs> I had a, a, another good friend, uh, Frank Lawson, he got checked out by the pilot standing on the wing. Frank's in the pilot seat, 
and he's telling him what to do. Mm -hmm. But then he gets off the wing, and Frank closes the canopy, and away he goes. So, so it was, uh, you know, it was a baptism of fire. Well, uh, how would you compare your 38 to P40? Oh my gosh, it's, 38 was like a Cadillac. You had this twin engines, 1500 <coughs> horsepower on each, and there was no torque. They right, rotated inboard together. So it was a lot smoother. A lot smoother, and you had the fire, firepower right in the nose. You had the 450s and 20 millimeter, and so you didn't have to worry about you know deflection and you know with uh, guns in the wings. They're separated and they mm -hmm. converge at a point. And you had to figure that, figure that lead. And uh, 38 was much better for for the firepower. Well, finally I had to fly missions, and uh, I had a, I had about 10 hours when I flew my first mission. And we used to have uh, red, white, blue, and green flights, four flights, and each squadron was made up of four flights and we flew what they call fingers four formation. You know, like this, two mm -hmm. here, two down here. This was a, well this would be red one, red two, red three, red four. And so my first mission I was red two. And uh, my flight leader uh, was maybe three or four years older than I was. He called me son. He says, uh, "Whatever you see uh, or whatever happens, don't worry about anything. Just, just stay on my wing." So, we took off with one belly tank and uh, full complement of gas on the main tanks. And normally, when you would get to a thousand feet or so, you'd switch to the belly tank and use that until you got to the target area. And uh, if you didn't, if you uh, were so busy that you couldn't check your tanks and look around the cockpit, sometimes the fuel from the mains would siphon out through the belly tank through the vent. And normally somebody on your wing would see it and say, um, ask you if you're taking a leak or you uh, vent fuel. So uh, my job was to stay with the Red 2 on his wing and I stayed on his wing. It was either full throttle or throttle all the way off but I stayed on his wing and I didn't see anything except his this other aircraft. But then two one on eyes made a head-on pass at us and my leader is flying, uh, firing at them, and here I am, a brand new pilot in P-38, and I've never seen a P-38 fire its guns. Well, here comes these pieces off the side of his airplane, and I finally had to realize that it's the shells coming out. <laughs> so we, we got uh, through the target area. At that time, we were escorting B-26s to uh, airfields. Uh, Places to bomb around uh, Naples prior to the Salerno invasion, and we get the bombers headed out back back home. And uh, Red One calls and says, "Squadron, let's have a fuel check." And I had to look at my gauges because when we got into action, we had dropped our belly tanks, of course. So I looked at my fuel gauges and I said, "Ooh," and I. Said Red One, I got uh, so much fuel, you know. And he says, "Okay, take it easy, son." <laughs> and he sent the rest of the squadron ahead, and he stayed with me, and he told me exactly what throttle settings to use. And he got me into uh, Naples, not Naples, uh, Sicily, with ten gallons of fuel left, and the P thirty eight. Each engine burns 30 gallon an hour. Well, I made it. That was the first mission. But I, I forgot to say that when we departed, we were stationed at Mature, and 
we didn't go back to Matur, we went to Sicily because we were going to cover the invasion of Salerno, and which is what we did. So, uh, I proceeded to fly missions and, you know, get, get a little more experience. Now, with the landings at Salerno, what, what did you do? Was clo close combat support or...? Well, we flew, uh, we flew high cover and they had three levels of cover and uh, uh, sometimes they would, we would have one belly tank and one bomb and after we patrolled for our hour, the controller on a ship in the water would tell us, give us a target to go to uh, inland, and uh, these targets we would, you know, dive bomb. And we uh, are equipment at that time for our bomb site. We had a, a little reticle under windshield with a circle and a dot and that was used for firing your guns but how we would dive bomb we would start diving down towards the target and when we got to about 3,000 feet we would pull up and when the reticle went past the target we'd drop the bomb. Uh, the first time I happened to be towards the end of the bomb run and I looked down and I, uh, out of the, out of uh, 12 bombs, 11 of them hit the railroad yards. And, uh, they were burning pretty good. But uh, most of our, my missions were bomber escort, uh, very rarely dive bombing and uh, at that time we were with the 12th Air Force and the 12th Air Force was uh, tactical. Then <clears throat> as the uh, war progressed and they had a lot more targets to uh, take care of, we became part of the Strategic Air Force, the 15th Air Force. And then we started escorting uh, B-17s, B-24s, and going longer distances. And uh, we were still taking off from a tour, Africa, and one of the uh, missions was a real long mission was to uh, Greece and uh, escorting B-24. And we uh, took off from a tour landed it on Sicily to refuel and then escorted the bombers to Greece. And um, I can remember on that mission seeing a lot of B-24s go down from anti-aircraft fire. And of course they were, when they were on their bomb run, they were very vulnerable to anti-aircraft fire. And we couldn't do anything about that. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you see the wings of a B-24 crumble, and what we would try to do is count the chutes. And sometimes there was nines, you know, sometimes you didn't see any. But that was, uh, that's what war is all about. So, you know, I continue to fly missions, gain some experience. Eventually I became flight leader and as, with more experience, uh, flight leaders would rotate squadron lead and then also <coughs> squadrons would rotate uh, group lead. And towards the list of my missions, uh, Sometimes I would have squadron lead, and then at the time that squadron would be leading the group, and you've got uh, 48 P-38s up there behind you. Now, was oh. your aircraft ever hit by flak at all? Pardon me? Were you ever hit by flak yourself? 
Oh uh, yeah. Yeah, I went once on a mission <coughs> <coughs> escorting uh, uh, seventeens to a target on the Adriatic coast of Italy. <coughs> And Kona was the name of the place. And we took off from a tour and we had to fly all the way northeast across Italy to rendezvous with the bombers. And we could see uh, fighters taking off on the ground to, you know, intercept us. And we rendezvous with the uh, bombers just about at the target time. and. Uh, what we would do if the enemy attacked us, try to get to the bombers, somebody would call them in, you know, and meanwhile, you know, your head's on a swivel, checking everything. And we used to weave, we used to weave so we'd cross here, and, and, and these two flights would start to weave a little later, and actually it was a constant weave. We would be, you know, looking all over trying to pick up an enemy that was going to attack us or the bombers. And uh, we used to have a procedure where when they saw one coming in, they would wait at the right time and they would, depending on which side they were on, they would call a break, either right or left. And <clears throat> we still had our belly tanks on. And uh, by some reason or other, somebody called the wrong break and they called the wrong squatter. So we were pep dog squadron and I had to be a flight lead uh, at that time. And all of a sudden I see these tracers coming in on my right boom. And I said, pep dog, break left now. I, we broke left to drop tanks at the same time. And here's airplanes breaking left and tanks falling over. And uh, I had taken a lot of uh, bullets into my right uh, boom. Right? And uh, so what I did is I just continued down and, and split ass towards the ground. And on the way down, I feathered up the uh, engine and got it so it was able to fly on, on a single engine. and. Uh, it was a cl scattered cloud deck at about 1,200 feet, and I figured uh, I would fly up under the cloud deck. Because, and if they uh, were going to make a pass at me, they had to come up underneath. So, in that attitude, I headed out towards the uh, coastline of uh, the Arantona onto the Adriatic. And as I came across Ancona, it was heavily defended with uh, uh, anti-aircraft artillery, like 88 millimeter, and I could see them shoot at me. I could see the flash, and whenever I saw a flash, I, I was kicked right rudder and skidded. They're tracking you on a straight line, and by skidding, I was able to, to escape the uh, the flak, and I finally got down on the deck, heading back down the coast of Italy towards the bomb line, which is where our friendly forces were. And uh, I was following another aircraft, and I, I wasn't sure whether that was one of ours or or German, so. I, I thought I would start to sneak up on them. <laughs> on one engine, maybe I, I get a shot at them. But finally they called me up and told me to identify myself. It was one of ours. And I says, okay, uh, uh, take me to a, uh, lead me to a strip. And I says, okay. So they took me in. And I landed and walked away from it. And, hmm, spent the night with some some guys I knew from uh, flight school that were flying uh, close support aircraft uh, for ground troops. And the next day I got a ride 
back to my unit in the B-26, continued the war. But did you fly, fly the same plane all the time? Yeah, but this day I had somebody else's. Mm -hmm. Did you ever name your planes or anything like that? Or yeah, was they just I those? named it after my wife. You did? Yeah. What was its name? Eleanor. Eleanor, okay. Yeah. Now you talked about a boom. What, what, what do you mean by that? Well, I have pictures here. 38. Okay. These are the booms. If you hold it up to the camera. These are the booms. Mm -hmm. And the, the uh, bullets went into the, the right boom. And uh, these are liquid cooled engines. And uh, when the, a coolant line goes, that engine's going to get very hot. And all you can do is, you know, shut it off. But that's, that's where I took that ordinance that day. Mm -hmm. Now, um, you mentioned here in, in the form that you filled out that uh, sometimes your equipment was inadequate, other times superior. What do you mean well, by that? Well, uh, I mean for pure flying equipment, I think it was superior to uh, what the enemy had. Mm -hmm. But as far as our uh, instruments for flying instruments or instruments for navigation, they were inadequate. Because for navigation, it was time and distance, dead reckoning, you know. That's a, a compass course and figure mm -hmm. time and, and uh, what your airspeed is. And, but for instruments, all we had is a needle. You familiar with what a needle is? Yes, that's how much. Needle, ball, and airspeed. And that's about all we had. Mm -hmm. Today they have, you know, much more exotic uh, mm -hmm. equipment for uh, the navigation of tourists with flying. Now you received the Distinguished fly Flying Cross, could you talk about that? Well, uh, one day we had a, a maximum effort. We were trying to get, uh, knock out the Ploesti oil fields because, you know, the oil and fuel is part of war. Mm -hmm. So with, they tried various methods they had Rogers Rangers that went on the deck in B-24s and lost a lot of equipment and men. And uh, so they would put up these uh, maximum efforts where you'd probably have hundreds of bombers in the sky and hundreds of fighters. And they're all going to plastic. <laughs> So this one day the target was Palesti and I happened to be leading the squadron and this our, was our squadron's turn to lead the group. And uh, nothing eventful happened. Uh, we, were climbing, we were climbing to altitude and the weather was uh, pretty bad. And but we were VFR on top. Uh, I don't know whether you you know what that means. No, well, I explain the cloud that. deck, you know. Mm -hmm. And when you're VFR on top, that means you have visual flight rules. You know, you can see. Mm -hmm. But uh, instrument flight rules is when you're in the clouds and you can't see, and then mm -hmm. you have to navigate the fly instruments by your air, air, aircraft instrument. So we were a VFR on top, and uh, most all of the bomb groups had turned back because of the weather. And uh, all of the f other fighter groups had turned back. But I was, I was still leading, and I was on top, and uh, had plenty of fuel, and had had no enemy action, and uh, I decided to keep going. And just, I, I saw a hole in the clouds, and when I could see down through a hole, I saw the Danube River, and I saw exactly where I was, because it made a, a right angle bend. And I made a slight correction in <clears throat> my course heading, and in 20 minutes we had picked up the lone bomb group that stayed there. So we proceeded, you know, the. Did help. you know they were out there? Did were I know you aware that? that they were out well, there? Well, I knew was, if somebody can get there, mm -hmm. I knew in the target area, and mm -hmm. I knew where I had to go to, to rendezvous okay. with them on the target area. So I just kept going, and the squadron with me with 48. P-38s, 
And sure enough, we found this lone bomb group getting shot up pretty good. They had lost six six bombers before we got there, but but we got them all back safely. We only lost one pilot, and he uh, we lost the airplane, but he ditched in the Adriatic, and Air Sea Rescue picked him up. So that was um, well, it was uh, a good mission for us, but not for the. 15th Air Force because they didn't um, didn't have any more uh, luck in knocking out Poesti, knocking out the uh, oil fields there. Because once they did get Poesti knocked out, then the war was almost mm -hmm. over. Because without the uh, oil, they couldn't fuel their airplanes, their tanks, their trucks. And, uh, it, was, it was a turning point in the in the war. Is there any one mission that uh, stands out more than others that, that you haven't told us about? or? Mm, well, the first one was... Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, well, you're so busy and... <laughs> flying formation is... Uh, well, you know, it comes with you after a while, but uh, we didn't really have much of that printing uh, before we got overseas, and we didn't really have much instrument training. Mm -hmm. And uh, oops, uh, well, let me a few missions that were really, you know, sticks on my line, like the. Uh, the first mission, uh, my 21st mission, which happened to be on the 21st of November, and that was when I had a ninja shot out, and uh, the mission to Poesti. A lot of them, you know, were, uh, they used to call them milk runs. Mm -hmm. How many missions did you fly all total? 51. That includes some over the, the Alps, uh, because we went uh, from Foggia, where we were based towards the latter part of the war. When we went to Germany, that was uh, we got a double credit for that. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the Mediterranean theater, to be rotated, uh, you had to complete 50 missions. Whereas in England, after 25, they could be rotated. So uh, I had, uh, well, I had reached my 50 by having 51. And I was sent home on the second group of pilots that were sent home after combat to have 30 days at home and then come back over, fly some more combat. And I was the second group of it that was sent home. And uh, we come back, come back over to uh, Foggia and uh, my unit had just come back from southern France, the invasion of southern France. And um, we had a new squadron commander, and we were met at the uh, port of Naples by General Eaker. And uh, the first group did so much bitching about having to go back. In fact, they were a sorry mess. I was uh, embarrassed to be with them. But we were the second group, and he met us, and he says, uh, he says I realize it's a pretty crappy deal. You know, you've been to combat, you're back home stateside, then you got to go back and come. It's war, right? Mm -hmm. Right? So he met us and uh, he says, oh, I'll give you a choice. You can uh, go back home, you can stay and fly more combat. And it's it's up to you, it's your decision. But he says, in the meantime, it'll take 30 days to get a ship made up so you can go back stateside again. So he says, meanwhile, uh, you can go back and stay with your units. So I got back to the unit and we have a new CO, his name was Major Pope, 
and uh, the guys had flown the, the uh, southern uh, France uh, invasion, and they had got a lot of time, a lot of missions, but not, not much action. And uh, they had lost a couple of pilots on accidents. So when I got to the squadron, uh, I was greeted by Major Pope and uh, Tom Rafael, who was a good friend of mine. He, he had been an operations officer, and uh, Major Pope says, Flynn, what are you going to do? I says, uh, gee, I don't know. I says, uh, and meanwhile, I was married. That's mm -hmm. another fact. So uh, he says, uh, how would you like to fly some more? He says, uh, I'll put you in for promotion and uh, uh, make, me make, uh, make you uh, deputy squadron commander. And I says, Major Pope, how long do I have to think about this? He says, oh, take your time. So I went over to the tent and I sat down. And I says, gee, Flynn, I says, I think you've used up all your luck. So I come back and I says, Major, it's a great deal, it sounds good, but I'm going home. And I think that was probably a good decision because a lot of guys that went out and got it on their first mission, a lot of guys had accidents, you know. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but, I, I, you know, I felt it was a good, good deal to go back home. Now, once you went back home, were you discharged, or did you stay in the well, service? Well, no, I, uh, I was first sent to uh, Cochrane Field, Macon, Georgia, and then they wanted to be, us to be uh, flight instructors. I think it was in the Bamboo Bobbery, you've heard of mm -hmm. that one? The old Beechcraft? Yeah, and this other friend of mine, and I were a little dissatisfied. So we wrote letters and we thought with our experience, you know, as multi-engine fighter pilots, uh, we were being wasted. So finally they, they agreed and shipped us to uh, Naples, Florida. And in Naples, Florida, we flew P-39s, P-63s as target aircraft for B-17 gunners. They would, uh, first they would fire, initially they would fire a gun camera. You know, we would make a passes at them and let the gunners, you know, fire at us with their gun camera to train the gunners how to, you know, track the aircraft. But then we got these armor-plated P-63s, they were orange, and they had a quarter-inch steel plate on vulnerable parts of the aircraft, and they fired a 30 caliber pet a fringe of a bullet at us, a plastic bullet. And, well, that was sort of fun, but... Uh, but finally, um, we got a chance to get out, and we got out. I came back home. Started settling down and, and didn't fly for about 11 years. But this friend of mine who was an automobile dealer had his own aircraft, he had a Beach Bonanza at, at the little airport in East Greenbridge. So one day after church, uh, I took my daughter Eileen down. She was about three years old, and I was talking to the fellow had the airplane, and uh, he says, come on, he's take you for a ride. So uh, he took the both of us for a ride, and uh, then I got the bug back again. And um, I used to see these uh, Army aircraft flying over, part of, you know, part of the National Guard, mm -hmm. L-19s. And I knew a, a friend that was a lieutenant colonel in the AAA uh, 
in, in oil media. Uh, and I called him and I asked him, uh, who owned those aircraft? He says, well, they're part of the National Guard. And I says, how do I get to fly them? He says, well, he says, I'll give you the name of a colonel and he can tell you who to call. So I called this colonel and he says, well, we have one opening in Glens Falls with the artillery battalion. So I went up Glens Falls and swore me in. I started, uh, well, I, I couldn't start flying them until I had been checked out and had federal recognition as a pilot. So I finally got that. I was flying L-19s. Occasionally you would um, get a beaver to fly. But meanwhile, I, I had no qualifications for uh, my rank as a captain in artillery. So uh, I had to start the uh, education progress process uh, by doing sub-courses at home. Mm -hmm. And I finally completed them in 10 months and uh, but then, you know, you've heard of ROPA, which is the Retired Officers Personnel Act. So many years in grade you had to get promoted. And so I had to start more courses and uh, but, you know, finally, uh, you know, one thing led to another and I uh, decided I should, you know, get some refresher training in the, in the uh, aircraft. So I applied for instrument school and uh, I went to Harbor Field in Baltimore, Maryland and completed a course in instruments there. And, uh, but and every time there was a chance for me to get to go to school, I would apply for it and get to go to school. And, one thing led to another, and I got, finally got my <coughs> qualification in artillery and went to schools, went to all the schools they had. Continued to fly with the Guard. I spent 23, 23 years in the Guard. Now, did you fly any other type of aircraft in the Guard? Beaver, I flew. Uh, the uh, Hiller helicopter, flew the Bell helicopter. So you went to Rotary Wing School also? Uh, yes, I went to uh, Texas. What's the name of that school about? Was it Fort Wal Walters? Fort Walters, yeah. I went there for Rotary Wing training. And uh, then we. Uh, Finally, got the uh, Hueys, mm -hmm. and I checked out locally in the Huey, and they would have like a month school, and we take leave from our jobs and uh, spend a month, you know, fly, flying training. So finally, I got qualified in the Huey, and, and then as you know, as Part of the instrument training, you know, once a year you had to take your instrument flight check and writ test. And uh, I, w I wound up in being an instrument instructor in the Huey. And that was um, my last assignment, probably. And you left the guard in 1980? 1980, yeah. I, when I reached the age of 60. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Um, you had some things. You want to show us some photographs that you brought in? Yeah. I guess. If you uh, hold each one like this, Wayne can focus on it, and you can tell, okay. you know, what it, what the photograph is. Okay. Uh, this is the 27th Squadron of the First Fighter Group in uh, January of 1944 in Foggia, Italy. And uh, I'm, I'm the first one on the bottom left here. OK. 
Okay. Now this this is the G6, in which I flew an advanced train. And uh, the number 434, it happens to be out at Dayton Air Force Museum in, in Ohio. And uh, I didn't realize this until I saw this picture and I took a picture of the T6 in Dayton and there's this 434 right there. Hmm. Oh, this is this is what what they call a hot pilot scarf, you know, the white scarf. Everybody had to have a white Where scarf. Where and when was that, was that taken? Huh? Do you remember about when that was taken? That was in 90, 19 44 in Italy. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> this is yours truly as an aviation cadet. You know, uh, okay. Now, you want to hold up your jacket and tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, you want me to try it on? Sure. <laughs> Will it still fit? <laughs> no. Oh, what's inside here? These are gloves that the British gave to us because we used to fly these P-38s at high altitude mm -hmm. with no heater and the temperature got pretty low. I can't zip it. <laughs> I weighed 141 pounds at that time. Is there anything on the back of it? No. Okay. No. Now you want to hold the gloves up too when you get a chance? So you received those from the British? That's, yeah, that's the story. Now the American it's Air Force did a uh, story in itself. They gave us these and they gave us uh, knee length zipper boots, mm -hmm. fleece line. You know, try to keep us warm at high altitude, and we didn't work. Oh, we froze. We have to pound our hands on something, you know, mm -hmm. keep moving our feet. And finally, we got uh, baby blue flying suits, two piece, and they were hooked together with an electric cord. And you had the, uh, like, boots that would insert, you could insert inside of your. Main boots, and they were hooked to the pants mm -hmm. electrically. Then you had a little plug in there with a rheostat, and you could turn the heat up. Mm. It was really, it really, really made it much nicer to fly. Now you brought a parachute. Uh, how did you get to keep that? Oh, well, that's that's a story in itself. That was a goof off. We were flying, uh, as I told you, down in Naples, Florida, flying it, flying gunnery uh, targets for the B-17 gunners. And we had straight 63s down there with no armor plate on. And 63, the P-63 was a, an advanced version of the P-39. It had a bigger engine and a little better flying. You know, one day this friend of mine <coughs> Came into the flight operations and he says, "What well, we have uh, two 63s out there." He says, uh, "You want to go fly them?" And I says, "Yeah, okay." He says, "I'll fl I'll fly your wing." And, and this guy was a frustrated flight instructor. He'd never been to combat, and uh, he was real gung ho. He really loved to fly. In fact, he used to take the T6 out and get it up to altitude and he would practice doing a roll at uh, takeoff speed. And one day he came to me and he said, Walt, well, he says, I'm going to slow roll a T-6 on takeoff. I says, you're nuts. <laughs> but sure enough, he did. He, he, he slow rolled the T-6 on takeoff and lived, and lived through it. But the, to get back to this day when we were both flying the P-63s, uh, it was a typical Florida afternoon day with a lot of cumulus clouds. So he's flying my 
my wing and we take off and climb to about 12,000 feet. And then we do a, a loop and he's running my wing doing the loop. And we do a couple more. Then I hold this, the last loop up and we go like this into a big old climbing turn. And at that point I lost my horizon and uh, I wound up in a uh, spin upside down tumbling and the P-39, P-63, that was one of their traits. It was because of the position where the engine was. The engine was quite a ways back, uh, almost at midships. So here I was in this uh, inverted spin tumbling and <laughs> Uh, this was about 11,000 feet, and 5,500 feet I'm still spinning upside down. So I decided to get out, and I pulled a release on the door, and the door wouldn't come open. So then I got my feet against the, the left side of the aircraft and pushed, held, held the door handle. I come out, shoot open. <laughs> But uh, my wife at that time was uh, pregnant for Bob, my oldest son, and uh, they couldn't get to me in the Everglades. And uh, they kept dropping me notes from an airplane, and uh, when they dropped the note, the wind would blow, and here I am chasing the note. So meanwhile, I had taken my parachute and cut the everything off except the shroud lines and the parachute. So when I stop, I spread it out and they can keep track of me that way. So finally I get this note and it says, hold your position. There's a guy on horseback coming in. <laughs> so sure enough, here comes the guy on horseback. Uh, they got me into the ambulance and I didn't realize I'd sprained my ankle. And uh, when I hit the ground, there was a a small pine tree and I had put my foot down to, so I didn't get impaled on this top of the uh, pine tree. But uh, I sprained my ankle and when I got in the uh, ambulance I realized that something was hurt. But they uh, just kept me for observation overnight. And uh, after I was back in base they Call my wife and tell her what I have. After you, you left service, did you make use of the GI Bill at all? Mm, well, I started night school, and uh, I really didn't didn't pursue it that much, you know. To uh, no, I, I wasn't 52, really 52 20 it. Club. Did you ever use that? Yeah. The fifty two twenty Club. Uh, yeah, that's where you got uh, oh, twenty dollars a week. Or... Yeah, yeah. But I went back to my job okay. when I came back because I I didn't really want to be an airline pilot. And at that time, they were starting at about two hundred fifty dollars a month out of town, so I I opted not to do that. Do you ever uh, join any veterans organizations? Yeah, I, I joined the reserve, uh, not a veterans organization, but I joined the reserve and they, they had no facility around here for training. You had to go down to Stewart Field mm -hmm. or something like that, so I couldn't pursue that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, okay. Do you ever stay in contact with anyone that was in service with you? Oh, sure. We have reunions. You? Uh, every two years. In fact, I'm going to a reunion in September. But uh, our uh, numbers are diminishing due to uh, old age, mm -hmm. and illnesses, and things. Uh, but the uh, Y unit is still flying. 27 squadrons flying, 94th, 71st, and they're, they're part of the 1st Tactical Fighter Wing mm -hmm. stationed at Langley. Mm -hmm. And they have been flying the uh, F-15 Eagle 
and uh, they rotate, have been rotating one squadron six months over in the Far East. And when they go over in the Far East, they, uh, it's a 14 hour flight for them. But that means three mid air refueling. And right now, uh, they're the uh, newest recipient of the F 22, the Raptor, the brand new fighter plane. Mm -hmm. And the 27th was the first one to get it. So. But the t between the 27th and 94th, 71st, there's always been a competition. In fact, the overseas, when we come back from a mission or when we depart from a mission, formation was critical because the, the enlisted men and the crew chiefs on the ground were always, you know, proud of their squadron. Mm -hmm. And uh, we would try to form up with the best formation. And then coming back, when we were coming into land, we had the four flights echelon right and stacked down just, you know, uh, just mm -hmm. to give the last flight enough room above the, uh, above the ground. And we would come, hit, come in and hit the end of the runway and peel up and see how quick we could land. They haven't been used a lot now, but I think in the future they'll be used more by historians and, and people doing research, uh, family members and so on. It's just right now they're, it's a re relatively new thing. Okay, you were, you were describing coming in, your flight unit, your squadron coming in, mm. and how yeah. they landed. Well, with 16 there, well, sometimes there wouldn't be 16, sometimes mm. there would be a few missing. But, uh, you know, part of the Air Force is show. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're part of a unit that you think is the best, and you, you try to look like you're the best. But that's... That's how we would uh, peel off when we come back from a mission. A mm -hmm. okay. um, couple questions I wanted to ask you that I didn't ask earlier. Um, did you ever have any confirmed kills? Uh, no, I didn't, but I had uh, some damage, which, you, you know, you can't claim those. Right. And, uh, I had one of my wingmen say I would I would claim it for you, but it's you know it's over and done with. It's mm -hmm. ipso facto, and uh, my important thing was just you know doing the job and uh, looking out for myself. Mm -hmm. to, uh, my major victory was I survived. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Did you ever encounter jets? The ME two sixty two. Yes. Uh, once in a while, I would see them. They they wouldn't stick around long, and uh, mm -hmm. I think one guy uh, one one. P-38 shot one down once, but uh, they, Hitler didn't pursue that because he wanted right. bombers. Yes. If he had pursued that uh, jet, jet air, aircraft uh, innovation, uh, it would have made a difference, I think. Were you still in when the war ended, or were you out by then? Um, yeah, you left. October 45, yes. yeah, I was still in. Yeah, because uh, I was at uh, Naples, Florida when there was victory in Europe was celebrated. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was, well, was a few short months after that, mm -hmm. that uh, victory in Japan. Yeah. Were they ever training you to go to Japan? Hmm. Were they ever training you to maybe Go to Japan? No, but uh, if the war had stayed long enough, uh, we might have been mm -hmm. assigned to something like like that because a lot of a lot of uh, people volunteered, you know, mm -hmm. for another tour or to go to Japan. Or, mm -hmm. But I forget. I did tell you one time about uh, we came back from the inversion invasion at Salerno, and when they had the uh, beachhead at Anzio. And uh, we were still on a tour, and then we got an assignment to go to near Alexandria, in Car near Cairo, because the British had some some fleet up there, and uh, they were trying to secure these islands and the uh, around the Dodecanese Islands there. 
and we got an assignment to go down and help the British uh, in that operation. So we landed just about dusk at a uh, field called Yambut 3, which is near Alexandria. And uh, it was such, such mass confusion that uh, there was no really landing strip there. And uh, what they used for uh, landing, they had a searchlight at one end of the room and shining straight up and searchlight at the other end of the room shining straight up. And, well, we finally got down, but there's a story where one P-38 taxied right through a hut of some natives there. And I don't know how true that is, but our mission there was to go patrol up around the Dodecanese Islands to help the British. And uh, we're in the desert, and it's sand. And to get the aircraft off, we had to take the whole squadron abreast because if you took one or two planes off, you raised so much oh, dust that nobody else would get off. <laughs> so that's how we get off. And while we were there, I think we were there a couple of weeks, I only got one mission in. And uh, yeah, we got off and we patrolled, and then we for uh, lack of fuel and uh, the weather, we landed at Cyprus. You've heard of Cyprus? Mm -hmm. And that was just like a resort in the States. You know, a paved runway, taxi came out to meet us, and we could spend the night in the bar, and it was, it was great. <laughs> but uh, then we had to come back to uh, that desert again. And if you didn't fly and the wind had come up, there's nothing to do except, you know, read or sit in your bunk and if you're reading before you turn one page the same <laughs> and if you go with the chow line with your cup you know you have sand <laughs> the wind blows so hard so much dust but boy we were glad to get out of there and that did a damage on the aircraft I was going to ask about the yeah aircraft. yeah they had to practically uh, disassemble and clean everything did you ever get to see any uso shows oh yeah yeah we used they had a Red Claws Club in uh, Foggia, and we used to go down there. Mm -hmm. Did you ever have any name entertainers that you saw? Mm, not really. Not really. Okay. How do you think your time in the service changed or had an effect on your life? Oh, it had an extreme effect. I, I don't know where I would have. I don't know where I would have wound up if I did. You just been at my job. Be, I don't really know, but the, the war gave me a chance to uh, do things that I would never do. Mm -hmm. And uh, because of the war and because of all the s schools I went to, I got a college degree without going to college. Mm -hmm. Because uh, for every position in the military, there's a MOS, and for each, that MOS is uh, it satisfies some educational requirement. And because I had been to all these schools and because I was a pilot and a flight instructor and uh, instrument instructor, uh, rotary aircraft, fixed wing aircraft, I got a lot of college points for that. And the last school I went to in the military was Command General Staff College, and uh, I got 30 upper-level college credits for that. So, so with all the schools, I got a uh, college degree in liberal arts. Okay, well, but that's... also, with the years in the military, I I, I was entitled to a pension, mm -hmm. okay. and. Uh, the pension comes out very nicely. All right. well, thank you very much for your interview.